Welcome to another TOEFL listening practice video. In this video, you will listen to a lecture, answer some questions about it, review the correct answers and explanations. Channel members can download their worksheets in the community tab of the channel. Don't forget to subscribe for more TOEFL listening practice. Good morning, everyone. In today's lecture, we'll explore a concept that sits at the heart of modern learning and productivity research, cognitive load theory, or CLT for short. Originally proposed by John Sweller in the late 1980s, the theory was designed to explain why some instructional methods are more effective than others, but its implications go far beyond the classroom. In fact, cognitive load theory can help us understand why multitasking on digital devices often feels exhausting, and why, paradoxically, we seem to achieve less despite doing more. Let's begin with the foundation. CLT is based on the idea that the human brain has a limited working memory. That's the mental workspace where we temporarily hold and manipulate information. You can think of it as a small whiteboard in your mind. You can jot down only a few items at once before it becomes cluttered. Once it's full, you either need to erase something or risk losing clarity altogether. Now, our long-term memory, in contrast, is practically limitless. It's where we store concepts, skills, and schemas. Mental frameworks that allow us to process familiar information quickly. Learning, according to CLT, happens when new information is successfully transferred from that limited working memory into long-term memory structures. But here's the catch. If working memory is overloaded, that transfer breaks down. We might still perceive information, but we don't meaningfully learn or retain it. Sweller identified three types of cognitive load, intrinsic, extraneous, and germane. Intrinsic load relates to the inherent complexity of the material itself. For example, solving a calculus equation naturally requires more effort than recalling a simple fact. Extraneous load comes from how information is presented. The design of a task or environment can either minimize or exacerbate mental strain. And germane load refers to the mental effort devoted to understanding and integrating information. This is the good load, the one that builds knowledge. Let's take an example from your daily experience. Imagine you're reading a difficult article online, a serious, concept-heavy one. While pop-up notifications appear, your phone buzzes, and multiple tabs are open. The intrinsic load is already high because the material is complex, but those distractions add extraneous load. They consume valuable mental bandwidth that could have been spent on germane processing, the part of learning that helps you internalize and synthesize what you're reading. The result? You understand less, remember less, and feel mentally drained. Interestingly, this isn't just theoretical. In laboratory studies, participants asked to learn new concepts under conditions of frequent interruption perform significantly worse on comprehension and recall tests. Brain imaging research supports this. Multitasking triggers rapid switching in attentional networks, creating inefficiencies in information encoding. Even short interruptions can produce what psychologists call a resumption lag, the time it takes to mentally reorient back to the original task. Over time, this constant switching increases cognitive fatigue and reduces learning efficiency. Now, CLT isn't merely descriptive, it's also prescriptive. In other words, it offers guidance on how to design environments that minimize unnecessary load. In educational settings, this means simplifying instructional materials, using clear visuals, segmenting information into smaller units, and avoiding redundant explanations. For example, when text duplicates what's already shown in a diagram, students expend unnecessary effort integrating the two rather than understanding the concept itself. The same principle applies to digital tools and interfaces. 
Designers who understand CLT try to reduce extraneous load by creating clean layouts, limiting notifications, and supporting focus. Features like Do Not Disturb mode, minimalist dashboards, and step-by-step -step onboarding tutorials are not arbitrary. They're cognitive load management strategies. When well-designed, technology can reduce strain. When poorly designed, it amplifies it. Another fascinating application of CLT is in workplace productivity. Knowledge workers today often operate in what researchers call high interruption environments. Emails, chats, alerts, and collaborative tools constantly compete for attention. A 2022 study by the University of California found that office workers switch between digital tools more than 1,200 times a day. Each switch imposes a small cognitive toll. Individually, those tolls seem trivial. Collectively, they fragment focus and reduce depth of thought, a phenomenon sometimes labeled fragmented cognition. So, does this mean we're doomed to shallow thinking in the digital age? Not necessarily. CLT also suggests ways to counteract overload. One strategy is chunking, or grouping related information into manageable units. Another is automation through expertise. As we become more skilled at a task, its intrinsic load decreases because we rely on existing schemas. For instance, experienced coders no longer think about each syntax rule individually. They process whole code structures as single units. Finally, let's not forget the germane aspect. Deep learning requires effort. Not all load is bad. The goal isn't to eliminate cognitive load entirely, but to balance it. Minimize the unnecessary, manage the essential, and optimize the constructive. In other words, design your environment so that your limited working memory can do what it does best. Make meaning out of complexity. So, to summarize, Cognitive load theory teaches us that human cognition is a limited resource. Digital overload, poor information design, and multitasking add extraneous demands that erode performance. By recognizing these limits and designing systems that respect them, we can foster deeper focus, better learning, and ultimately more sustainable productivity. One, what does the professor emphasize as the central implication of cognitive load theory? Two, according to the lecture, what distinguishes germane load from other types of cognitive load? Three, why does the professor mention pop-up notifications and multitasking? Four, what can be inferred about task switching from the lecture? Five, 
Listen to part of the lecture again. For example, when text duplicates what's already shown in a diagram, students expend unnecessary effort integrating the two. Why does the professor say this? Six, what overall conclusion does the professor reach about cognitive load? 